institutional and cultural buildings in the context of civic work and correlate architecture with landscape and urban planning. In particular, Rogers Partners aims to transform the modern city as is evidenced in their work of expanding Syracuse University's coal gen energy plant into um, a community asset, as well as the waterworks park along the Mississippi River in Minneapolis, and that's what brought uh, Mr. Rogers here tonight. Uh, Rob Rogers holds a BA and a BArc degree uh, from Rice University and a Master of Design Studies from GSD. He is currently directing the designs of the Constitution Gardens and Pavilion on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., the Henderson Hopkins Elementary School in East Baltimore, the Sandridge Energy Headquarters in Oklahoma City, among many other projects. Uh, tonight, he'll speak to us about learning through practice. So now, let's welcome Rob uh, Rogers. You guys can hear me all right from here. There it is. That's all. So it's here? OK. Um, thanks. This is, I've, I've been coming to Minneapolis for about the past six or seven months while we're working on the Waterworks Park and waterfront design with Kate Orr from Skate Landscape Architects. And uh, this is by far the nicest day uh, that I've had since it's here. So it's, I'll try to get through this so you can get out before it's dark. How about that? This is, and enjoy that terrific day. Um, I, have, I loosely titled the talk Learning Through Practice because um, I'm not an academic and I'm not a theoretician, although I've, I've taught studios and adjunct leave uh, for almost all of my career in one way or another. And when I think about how we try and organize our thinking in our work, and it's not necessarily through a manifesto, and it's Roger's partners. I've got four associate partners, so we really all develop specific skills, and we think collaboratively, and we work together. Um, and I organized the talk around how do we actually make our decisions and set our goals within that. And I call it learning through practice, because architecture is this sort of unusual activity where uh, you don't actually get to um, learn by doing something over and over. Or if you do, then you're working in a practice that does all of one thing sometimes. And I've, I've always gotten a little bit bored with that. So we have an incredibly diverse practice where we do some developer buildings, we do some commercial buildings, we do inst work for institutions work for the government, public space. And one of the challenges about working that way is that, sorry, let me do that. How about that? And that one's off, so that's good. Um, is, is that you never, you never really become an expert, and so you're constantly trying to learn I'll just try to hold it further back. Um, constantly trying. Okay. Can you can you hear me? If I just talk without this thing, we'll put it down and see how that works. We can we can turn this off and turn that one on. How's that? You guys all right? Okay. So. <clears throat> So the, the effort is how do we develop a process that lets us not learn by doing something over and over, but actually try and figure out how to do something right and do something really right the very first time. And what it leads to is a, really an exercise in developing a lot of research um, and being willing to do a lot of research that ends up on the floor or in a cabinet somewhere that actually doesn't evolve into the elements of the project itself over time. And so I'm going to 
open the f sort of first half of my talk talking about the kind of things that we discover and what we look for. And it's, it's certain sets of principles that we have derived from working together over time. And I'll just talk about four of those. It's not like this is a codified package where we post them on the wall and say this is what we're going to do, but it, it's a kind of set of values and attitudes that we have developed over time. And so one of those is what we kind of say is small things, is, you know, sometimes really big, important, or amazing things come out of really small things. And so I'll talk about a couple of those sort of things that we've looked at or we've developed, and, and sometimes these are references that develop directly into projects, uh, and sometimes they're just part of continuing your own education as an architect. And so one of those is, is the, the idea of the shelter belt. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it, but in 1934, as the Dust Bowl was going on around, the U.S. Forestry Service had a very simple idea that said, we need to plant trees. And from 34 to 42, they planted 220 million trees, mostly in Oklahoma, Kansas, Colorado, Nebraska, all through the Midwest. And this idea, hey, let's plant some trees, actually changed the ecology and the microclimate of entire portions of those states and began the recovery from erosion and desolation of those landscapes in that period of time. And, you know, you talk about it, you talk about hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of square miles from this idea of, well, what if we just planted trees? We also like to remember that it sometimes it doesn't take much. And it, it's not like you're absolute minimalist in the, in the modernist sense, but understanding the, um, what you can do with the least amount of material sometimes is something that we talk about, both because of its sort of aesthetic culture and its economic content and the intellectual endeavor of that refinement. And so we look at the work of somebody like Fred Sandback, who actually completely changes space by organizing a little bit of yarn. And you can talk about really big things even in a small way. We were one of four finalists for the Eisenhower Memorial in Washington, D.C. And one of the things that while we were looking at his life that we found incredibly impressive was, you know, he was a, he was a kid that grew up in Nebraska in the middle of the prairie. And that, he, over and over in his writings, he talks about his youth and the sort of thinking about land and the space and the condition of the prairie. And this guy who went on to become one of the most consequential world leaders always had it in his background. And so when we made our proposal for the memorial, we decided that we needed to represent this idea of the American prairie and, and this little boy's life. And somewhere in the context of all of the other things that the memorial needed to discuss and interpret, that, that moment needed to be revealed. The second of the things that are sort of these categories, if you will, is delight. We have an unbelievable amount of fun while we work hard, but we also believe that when we produce buildings and projects and spaces, that there needs to be a little sense of humor, there needs to be pleasure, and there needs to be engagement. And so, you know, when, we, when you think about the story of, of Goldilocks, and it sort of gets simplified down to just right, but I think it's more what's the definition of just right. It's not that the chair fit, or that the porridge was okay to eat, or that the bed was just about the right softness. It actually was just right. It was delightful, it was special, and it worked for her at that time in that place in that way. And to try and 
understand your intentions and your audience and your engagement with that level of concern and approach. That chaotic systems actually occasionally have amazing order. And so even when we're looking at kind of complex problems where there's overlap of different constituencies and policy problems and social issues, you, there is an opportunity to find an underlying kind of order. And when that jiggles into place, you kind of recognize it. It's sort of just right. And like finding this sort of crazy cloud structure that aligned itself into a grid is a, is a way that we can talk about, is that, is that one of these moments? Is that it? And if so, why? How can we work towards that end? That things you do have lifespans, and the work and the pieces and the parts can actually change materially over time, and it doesn't mean that it's bad or it's wrong. This, was, this is Yellowstone forest recovering after the disastrous uh, forest fires in the 80s. And there's a, there's a kind of elegance to that time change and the opportunity. And so recognize that you're doing something for a longer, bigger picture. And use color. Um, you know, a bit of contrast, some density, uh, and elements composed against each other that you don't expect can create that kind of moment where you actually, you know, smile and enjoy it. And one can be a piece of color. This is actually the Terrell installation at Rice University. But it can also be really physical. You know, the grid of Washington, D.C., and the overlay of L'Enfant with the amazing diagonals that create view quarters, view sheds, are, are metaphorically describing the relationship of the three main branches of the government and how they interrelate. Like these are super scale ideas about the city. But there's a moment at I.M. Pei's East Wing when all of those things actually become physical and material in that little 17 degree sliver that slides up there. And you can actually go up there and you can touch it and you can rub it. And the, that sort of geometry of L'Enfant is actually made manifest in a physical way at that little moment. And that's, that it's, it's a place where we say, that's terrific, it's amazing. And these examples feed us as we think about our own work. We do a lot with open space and public spaces. And then you guys have a school of landscape architecture here. Some schools don't. I have, we have several landscape architects in our office as well as urban designers. And despite all the sort of wrestling or battling of where the ground lies between what architects do and landscape architects do, the fact is making and dealing with public spaces is one of the most profound opportunities in architecture and design. And so we embrace it wholeheartedly in lots of different ways. So for instance, when we were working on a, a park and a pathway system in Cody, Wyoming, we actually started by looking at th what this is, the very first irrigation canal that was built in that entire part of the state. And that system really begat the land use and the occupation and the agricultural opportunities that were a part of that piece. And so we began to think about what the nature of public space was and the way that interlinks and reaction of recreation spaces could actually begin to feed and play a role in the way that the town and the city continued to develop. And thinking about public space is a lot of thinking about program because People don't always use things the way you expect them to. And that might actually be a really good thing. And so think broadly about what the, the opportunities and the things are. So for instance, when we uh, entered the competition for Governor's Island in New York, we were teamed with West 8 landscape architects out of 
Rotterdam. You know, we made this collage from some of our uh, research images and some of our speculations that said when you've got this island in the middle of the harbor, what are the opportunities for recreation, for interpretation, for research, for ecology? Um, what if we actually manufactured a topography that gave, introduced new views and ideas about how the key elements of the harbor, like the Statue of Liberty, could actually be seen and framed through other activities? And sometimes thinking about public space is, is not thinking about the objects we normally focus on or that garner our attention. Um, this was actually a competition we didn't win in Hudson Yards for a, a public space around what was going to be a highly figurative and special building. And we said, well, what, is, what are the ways that you can think about that space being dynamic and changing and exciting, yet fully support the idea of the centralized architecture that's already going to be there. And so we tried to understand what's the, what is the space and role of the hula hoop in that way? How does it interact with an individual? And, and can a space begin to have those kinds of dynamic qualities? And it sounds odd, but look for the unexpected. This is a quarry where they took all of the headstones uh, they needed after the Battle of Gettysburg for Arlington Cemetery. And in the winter, it begins to freeze, and so it fills with water, and it actually becomes a space. You can get out on the black ice and go into this portion of the quarry. Just when there's been enough, long enough, cold enough weather, then it actually becomes a habitable space. And it's a completely man-made thing, the light is amazing, the materiality is amazing, and it's got this temporal quality. And so it's not like really good public space has to perform all the time for everybody. It might have moments when it's really elegant and it's really terrific. And then it just performs another role in other times. And then there's big things. Like, we still want to embrace the, the big ideas and the big issues. And I've worked around the country and I've said, you know, the flying whenever, the impact of the Jeffersonian grid on the entire portion of the Louisiana Purchase is amazing. And so you think about how that organized land use and land ownership and how those kinds of structures begin to have all sorts of secondary and tertiary impacts that you may not have understood when you first apply the overall structure. So this is just a bunch of expansion joints on the tarmac at the airport in Oklahoma, but it's amazing how it actually controls the evaporation of water so that it doesn't run and pool as it begins to be smaller amounts. It drains in the big way, but as it gets smaller and smaller, it actually gets confined and controlled in ways that allows the evaporation to finish the task. And the systems that are already in place that then have amazing impact on the architecture and the buildings and the fabric and the circulation that happens this is Barcelona, New York, and Portland, where you, the, the uniformity of the Barcelona grid allows this uniformity of, of fabric and sort of enforces it. New York, with its, its kind of hierarchy of the avenues and streets, actually completely controls the land use and the commercialization of the, of the avenues and the residential development of the streets and the side streets in between. And Portland, which has this, it's for a, a U.S. city, it's a really small grid, and it's regular, but it's made it one of the most delightful pedestrian cities in the United States and in the world, because it's created this, this almost infinite variety of ways that you can move through the city 
that are comfortable and comprehensible and understandable. And as a pedestrian, you get the variety. You don't have the long haul blocks in New York that seem like forever. And as you move around that city, it's, it just feels like uh, you're comfortable in all spaces and all times. And we haven't abandoned the big social ideas. Um, projects like Pruitt Igo, which proved in 10 years how many mistakes could be made in terms of social organization, doesn't mean that you still don't have social obligations and social responsibilities. But how can you make an investigation? How can you insert it, whether it's a small scale or large scale, understand that you still got fundamental issues of uh, inequity and balance of opportunity and exposure throughout your projects. And it happens in lots of different ways. You know, as, as Detroit is decaying, frankly, and you have this dismal loss of city services, at the same time, you have people that are developing sustenance farming, almost like the original pioneers, where the vacancy of the land use and the loss of the city services actually becomes an opportunity to rethink how you occupy a city and what you do with your residents and your land and your surroundings. And we think about circulation a lot um, because we feel like you have to think differently. Uh, we all know the issues of cars and we're trying to introduce bikes and put all those other things. But even on a, another step up, whether it's in our cities or in our buildings, you know, and, and look at things like, hmm, a ski area is about nothing but moving, really. So how, how many people can you move where and why? And what if it was all skill-based, which it is at a ski area, you go to where you're capable of, of making the descent. And it sort of self-organizes around that. So when we did a competition for the I-Beam Museum in New York, we said, what if, what if we think about moving in a building that way, that just a completely different strategy, that it's actually about your experience and your skill. Have you been there once or 10 times or 50 times? And there are different ways to think about circulation itself. And in New York, this was for a competition that we also didn't win for Brooklyn Bridge Park. But that's also, we do an, a fair number of things we don't win, but they feed us intellectually throughout the project. And so in this case, we mapped Central Park into the East River to try and say, you know, what is recreation space? What is open space? Who gets to use it? What kind of tools and rules do you have to put in place to change the perspective about what are the public spaces of our cities? And never forget how unbelievably symbolic architecture can be. So with that as a preface, kind of a smattering of the way we begin to think and we begin to work and we start looking at things to go on. I've selected four projects to talk about and, and I'll not try to say, oh, well, this is the moment where we saw delight. But that's for, for you to read and test me to see if you can see in the projects as I talk about them that, you know, the pieces were quality evidence for us to move forward or they should have been left on the floor. So in Baltimore, one of the most successful of the 19th century American cities in the United States, we're doing a, a K through eight school um, with an urban renewal group that's gonna be run by the Johns Hopkins University. And the neighborhood is best known for David Simon's The Wire. It's an incredibly depressed place that 100 years ago was a vibrant middle class working neighborhood full of row houses and townhomes and factories and churches and people. And from the post-war white flight 
and the sort of decline of city attention, the neighborhood has become, had became one of the most dangerous slum neighborhoods in the United States. Had an occupancy rate just below 20%. And by comparison, at the nadir of New York's South Bronx, it was about, South Bronx was about 55% occupied. So th this is an incredible sort of collapsing place. And there have been a lot of efforts to think about what to do with it or how, how what it meant for renewal in this neighborhood. And as we got engaged, there are things about it that are really amazing. The, the landmarks of these neighborhoods are the churches and the big places of employment. This is a brewery. And what would happen is most people that were in and around walking distance of these centers lived and owned those townhouses, and this is where they worked. And that was the fundamental fabric of the city. And even though it's been in decline, it still is this sort of um, remarkable character that we wanted to think about at the project. And the fabric of the neighborhood is really rich because the way it was built out, all of those little rows of houses are out to the street. And there's row houses, smaller houses on what they called alley streets that are behind them so that home ownership was always in an affordable means. And the urban renewal district, as I said, were, had been working on this area for about 15 years. And they put in some affordable housing. Uh, and it wasn't very successful because who the hell wants to move into that neighborhood? And then they put some senior housing in there, which was also really minimally successful because everybody was scared to death of the rest of the neighborhood and why on earth would you move your, your mother into that neighborhood as she aged? And a really, really smart guy got involved about five years ago and reworked the master plan and said, what if we built the best public school in Baltimore and we put it in the middle of this neighborhood? that would be the catalyst to completely change potential land value and understanding throughout the neighborhood. And we, this was a competition we did win. Um, and so one of the fundamental premises as we began to look at what was a two block section of this was that we didn't want to eradicate the fabric to put up some strange new beast right in the middle of the neighborhood. That in fact, the building to be successful had to be of the neighborhood. And we felt like it had to hold the street and it had to reflect the spatial order of the neighborhood itself while performing its educational program requirements. So we started working with Johns Hopkins about well, what, what is the spaces, what spaces are needed for the best public school in Baltimore. And they recently were ranked number one in School of Education in the United States. And they have an incredibly progressive and thoughtful new dean who also moved into this neighborhood while the building was under construction. Um, and he said, the first thing we have to do is break down the idea that there's a teacher and a classroom. And so the spaces of this school are not at all based on the number of classrooms that you need for the number of students. In fact, we have less than half the number of classrooms you'd normally build for a population of over 500 K through 8 students. And so we organized the students. This is working on the pedagogy with Johns Hopkins, where classes are clustered together, first and second grade, third and fourth grade, fifth and sixth grade, the little guys all together. And let them share a group of facilities that are classrooms and seminar spaces and flexible spaces and common spaces and tailor those groupings to the environmental, educational, and experience capacity of those ages. So what we became to call houses, house one for pre-K and kindergarten is actually insular. It's got an outdoor space that's completely protected on all sides. 
and you can see everybody and your world becomes small enough that you can really engage the world of education and you learn to move away from home. And as you grow, the complexity of your spatial experience of school grows with you. And travel begins to become a privilege and an opportunity in an effort to start thinking about your own responsibility for your own education. So we designed a series of these houses, these groups which had classrooms, common spaces, their own servery, we abandoned the idea of central cafeteria because as Dean Andrews would say, only bad things happen in cafeterias. And so you actually begin to eat, socialize, learn all collectively in these houses that are then grouped together volumetrically and spatially so that you can proceed from the youngest age to the oldest age, from being fully contained and fully wrapped up to actually having to move between separate buildings for science and art and go two stories and move around at your own responsibility. And all of those houses need to be linked without door spaces. So each one of those houses has an associative outdoor learning space that belongs specifically to them. But they also participate in a larger spatial and social construct of those things acting together in concert. And we decided to create as the core of each house a big daylit common space. Many of these kids have both sometimes three meals through public assistance and school programs. So you start your day here in a big bright lit space and it might be evening by the time you're gone. And if you remember the picture of the brewery from before, we said, so let each one of those houses begin to have an identity so that you spend two years in it. You know it from without the school. You can identify it. You're not a room number. You're not down a hallway. But you actually begin to have a, a, a spatial understanding of your educational experience. The school is also organized so that key public functions for the community, gymnasium, auditorium, and community health and social services center are in that south bar so that they're all fully accessible from the street, yet they also link to the primary corridor of the entire school so that all of those services and spaces serve the school as well. And so inserted into that neighborhood is this series of public building pieces that we wanted to reflect and understand the character of the street and actually extend the social spaces of the street and the community volumetrically and with alignment right into the school itself. And so part of the site was we took over a piece of street, Collington Avenue, which was one of the primary corridors of the neighborhood when it was at its peak, uh, amazing social space of the street overseen by, the, in this case, the uh, Church of St. Wenceslaus. And so we let that become the primary social corridor of the school itself. And so the landmarks of the community surround still stand up as a way to organize your own travel and your own spaces, but those pieces are there. But even the subcategories of space, what were the alleyway streets that were for the smaller homes that lined up against each other and were literally the play space and play yards of, of those generations are interpreted in the school here by an outdoor space that links the pre-K, K, and everybody up through about third grade to an outdoor corridor that leads to community gardens and a, and a big play area. And the neighborhood had a, actually, at times, a, an interestingly successful and mixed demographic ownership. And it had to do with the idea that the, the house was yours, the stoop was your kind of domain, and the street was fully public. And so the, the social importance, these are small houses, these are you know, 15, sometimes 15 to 20 feet wide, two stories, not very deep. And so that outdoor space was fundamental to the social interaction of the community. 
And so we interpreted that in the way where every one of these houses that are the collective things have their own courtyard and have their own sort of social space um, that links the interior and exterior together. And since you're from Minneapolis, you can understand that these are February photographs. The other thing was just kind of what is the, what's the character of the neighborhood physically? And it was these series of, of townhouses put together that actually modulate the topography of Baltimore by easily stepping down the street. And so our street elevations do that as well. And the materiality of the neighborhood ranged from really high quality face brick, brick in some of the larger homes to kind of crummy brick on the smaller homes that over the years had actually been resurfaced. With, if anybody knows Baltimore, it's kind of a, it's <clears throat> the equivalent of the aluminum siding salesman um, of years and years ago where they actually applied a cementitious stucco and then they stamped it with a kind of a stone pattern and it's called form stone and probably 30% of the buildings in the neighborhood had this surface treatment which we chose to reinterpret through a, a precast system which is actually the entire structure, interior and exterior wall of the school itself with a, a customized form liner that allowed us to make an interpretive gesture towards the masonry character and scale of the buildings of the surround um, and bring that together with these large luminous uh, spaces which are actually clad in a polygal which is an ordinarily used as an industrial skylight material. So that these common area spaces are treated with really a, a kind of level not monumentality, but a generosity of volume and space, uh, which is completely different than most of the experiences these kids have had in this neighborhood before, and create these common collective areas that establish uh, an idea about identity and belonging to those spaces where you still are fully aware of the neighborhood around, but have integrated this school and its play yards uh, within that so that the fabric has a continuity although the program has been completely transformed. This school uh, opened in January. As I said, we do really different kinds of projects. And so this next one is an energy company headquarters in downtown Oklahoma City. And Oklahoma is one of those places where you have to be careful. You can't talk about politics. You really can't talk about religion. And it's probably good not to bring up too much uh, sort of environmental conversation because it's a, it's a mainstream headquarters of many of the energy companies that are actually part of the leaders in discovering and utilizing fracking throughout the United States. So when I got a call to go and talk to this guy about his headquarters building, I was a little, um, a little scared, a little bit concerned. I didn't, you know, is this, can we do this thing? And after my earliest conversations, he was uh, an incredibly interesting guy. Yes, a fracker, but also somebody who hired 30 ex-cons every year uh, to work in the mailroom and be drivers and said, you know, you're never going to see my name on the museum because everybody else wants to do that, but I give my money in other ways and other places. And I had a, a real affinity for him early on. And I said, well, if you want to locate in downtown Oklahoma City, don't go build, you know, your own new skyscraper. There's already somebody doing one of those. That's the thing. If you really want to do the best thing for the city, don't do this do this. Land is unbelievably cheap. It's one advantage coming from New York is everything else is cheap. And spread yourself out and have a different kind of attitude than trying to be special and singular. So located a property downtown that actually had uh, Pietro Beluski designed 30-story tower that had been vacant for about 15 years. 
And so he bought that building and began to buy property all around it. Um, and with this idea that the way to recharge and reinvest in your city is not by single large-scale occupancy projects, but by multiple pieces that can be inserted and developed over time that actually engage the street life and return activity from parking garage to tower into building to building to building. Um, and we began to work together and identified what's in white here as a series of potential building sites and growth. The, the blue line is sort of the primary civic corridor of Oklahoma City. It links the, what is their, um, going to be their central park, which is their largest park downtown, Myriad Gardens, and the memorial to the bombing. And on the other side of these series of sites is the primary cultural corridor and commercial corridor that's being uh, redeveloped in the city. So it's old automobile garages turning into restaurants, people occupying brick factories, doing that sort of thing. And that we would locate this project in a place where these corridors crossed and call it the Sandridge Commons and begin to engage the city as, as broadly and as intricately as we could by tackling this series, a series of buildings and a series of public spaces linked into the fabric of the city. So with Pilatro Bluski's tower at the centerpiece, which also meant he could occupy quickly, then we began to do preservation restoration of an old building, construct new buildings, and master plan for additional buildings to be developed around. Giving honor at the same time, it was interesting when we went down there, nobody knew who Pietro Bluski was. Um, there had been other kind of plans like putting wavy, uh, if anybody, I hope somebody in here knows Pietro Bluski, putting all kinds of wavy canopies around the building and stuff. And we said, this is actually quite a stately piece of modernism. What you really need to do is live it, leave it alone and give it some space to breathe. And it, it'll actually be quite a majestic and stately building. So we planned to do this series of buildings. This one is uh, a restored building, which is a landmark on one side and reclad on the other around the base of the Belusky building, putting an all new building across the street to house the amenities uh, for the company as it has to attract people to choose to come and live in Oklahoma City. Um, and then the idea was link these ideas with really high quality public space and invite everybody else in. Do not define your property line. Actually put your employees on the street and invite everybody else to engage in that street life with you. There's one problem with that in Oklahoma City, which is it's got a really terrible climate. It is unbelievably frigid in the winter and it can be incredibly hot in the summer and it's windy almost all the time. So we said that that's, that's not a reason to deny people public space, but that becomes the constraints with which to work. So working with Arup's uh, microclimate and environmental group, we began to try and understand all of the specifics of what we really needed to think about in terms of the microclimate of this particular series of blocks. And now you see where the shelter belt came from, but during our research, looked at landscape as a strategy to begin mitigating the climactic conditions at the grade level to manage and organize those public spaces. And when you're making those, you're not trying to make every space desirable all the time, but you need a place to go when it's really hot and you need a place to go when it's pretty cold. But then you also, you know, an eight mile an hour breeze is really nice. A 25 mile an hour wind is not. And so if we could make a series of places that were habitable under a variety of conditions and times, then there's, you can reach a point where you, it's desirable to be outdoors almost any time if it's properly constructed and organized space. And there's a, this long history of landscape to control the wind and the climate, specifically in Oklahoma and its surrounds. And, and there's actually quite a bit of 
proven understanding about what kind of manipulation works and can happen and can be done. So we took that along with Arab's information and actually built the wind tunnel model to model all of the effects on the site so that we could really organize plant species and organize things to intentionally create climactic zones of desire and comfort at grade level. Very dense landscape for a traditional urban environment. And that began to let us think about that ground plane in the wind. But there's other more extreme elements as well, just in terms of solar gain, and then there's wind shear because of the, the high buildings. And so continuing with Arab's group, we identified the most extreme of those conditions and said, you know, if you simply remove the extreme, you actually get quite a desirable place and quite a desirable condition for much of that time. So if we can erect a structure that helps us enable that piece of public space, it can also begin to perform other kinds of programs. In this case, a, a, almost a proscenium-like space to enable outdoor performance and occupancy at different times of day. And construct that thing, we decided, out of multiple layers, understanding that, you know, being in pure shade is good only when it's really hot. And what you really want is a variety of shade and a quality like under a really, you know, under a really good tree, like a, like a locust tree blowing in the wind, where it has a dynamic quality. And so with two kinds of materials and perforations spaced apart, you actually get a shade that is changing all the time, just because of the motion of the sun. And erect that to knock out that worst hot, hottest spot across the site and create a publicly occupiable zone that then is useful whether there's two people at a table or 200 for an outdoor performance and cr use the rest of the site work to create pockets of desirable habitability and let the, let, let what we weren't learn about the wind and its conditions inform us in the detailing where our landscape architects said we had to put wires and all this stuff on all the trees to keep them from blowing over. And I said, well, for how long? And I said, I don't know, maybe forever. I was like, well, that's crazy. So let's build a light fixture that is actually a structural stabilizer for the plantings that we want to grow and enable in this particular area and develop the sense and quality of that public space as something that participates with the building and its employees, but also the city and the population as a whole. So introduce programming that actually brings engagement into the building and that public space from throughout the city. So a current project right now we're doing for Syracuse University. And uh, this was a competition, which we won. Um, and it was interesting because they decided that they had to replace their power plant with a new cogen facility. The chancellor had made a commitment to be carbon neutral by 2025. And one of the biggest problems is that their old power plant was a, a sort of aging behemoth. And so they did a bunch of engineering studies. And then they started to look at what they needed to do first. And so they made plans to bring in a high power, high pressure gas line. And that involved a community meeting. And if you can see just north of the red line and the power plant, where were power plants located in basically the early 20th century, but in the middle of the low income, uh, public housing and African American neighborhood of Syracuse as a town. And they got incredible community pushback about, nobody understood what a high pressure gas line meant. It was, is that frightening? Is it good? Is it bad? What's it gonna mean? Uh, so then they sought to do an architectural competition. And when we made our submission, we said, well, we can make you 
help you make the plant look better, that's not a problem, but you can't deal with public condition with aesthetics. That's about program. And you're going to have to think differently about the program of the power plant. And it's interesting, it's one of the reasons I like competitions is, is sometimes you can actually be quite risky and, and still succeed when you respond. And they, they began to understand that, and I'll show you what the, the outcome of that is. So this is the, the big plant as it existed with its component pieces and parts. There's one other piece of the puzzle, which is this I-81 is a highway that's either going to be expanded or they're going to tear it down and build a boulevard. Either way, it's going to encroach on the potential chilled water plant as it existed. So these pieces are going to have to move around. And so we said, okay, well, that's, we have no problem. The engineers had already figured out the, the boxes that they needed to have. Um, and we'll reorganize those boxes in a way that uh, operates with the spatial surroundings. And, and part of this was trying to make the architecture not intrude on this incredible engineer's world of the power plant and what they wanted to do and, and how everything had to run. Um, and so we said, fine, take those boxes that you're going to build and put the stuff in it that you need, and that's fine, and we'll give you a completely controlled access for your staff. So they can go in and out the way they always have, you know, in isolation from everything in and around and surrounding them. But we need to introduce a public path and a way to move through these buildings for students to come down here as well as everybody else. We proposed that the building with the smokestack at the very top, which was not going to be used for uh, any of the new power generating facilities, but they were going to hold on to and use it as a, a maintenance and storage facility for trucks and pipes and valves and stuff like that. We said, fundamentally, you need to change that, and that should become an academic building, and it should have social program. And it becomes the destination point for students that move down from the campus and move into here, and then it also begins to engage the community. And so we started working with the Falk College of Human Sciences, where they're actually going to occupy the building with social sciences and a new urban agriculture program. And so produce this circulation link that actually demystifies the power plant. Let it be a pathway that actually goes through at the upper level, making use of the topographical change to, to move through the plant and explain all of the sustainability issues that are being addressed by the changes in these systems and their functions, and let that path then arrive at this transformed steam station, which has become a community and educational facility um, in the heart of this neighborhood, and program the building at its base layer with community services, markets, and teaching spaces, academic laboratories above, research laboratories, and the roof is covered with greenhouses where we're making use of the waste heat from the cogen process to actually run the greenhouses throughout Syracuse's long winter. And so the building, there also everybody was really concerned the architects were going to come in and make it fancy or expensive, and I said again, it's mostly about the program, but let's talk about how the building can simply begin to, to become something other than a big black metal steam station. So we'll do very simple things. We're going to put a nice resilient base on it for you. There's a couple feet high, at least all the way around. And then put up your steel building. Just put up the thing you thought you were going to do. It's kind of a all, just this side a prefab steel structure with the big foam and steel panels that go on the outside like those big horrible metal buildings that we think of in Walmarts and stuff like that. So just go ahead, that's fine. Then punch all the grills that you need because there's all kinds of demands for louvers in, air out, doing a bunch of stuff. No problem, just punch all of that stuff in there. Whatever the engineers want, we'll give it to you. Then. We said, let's put in windows wherever you actually have staff so that people, whether they're operating on the floor of the cogen or they're in offices or they're doing something, they should all have daylight to work by. 
And so we'll punch all of these windows in wherever they are needed po programmatically. And we'll come back and wrap this in an expanded steel mesh that's a kind of coppery color that allows all of those other functions to continue to happen, but begins to give us some formal compositional and volumetric control of the architecture. Let that circulation path be luminous, and you can see in and see out. You know people are moving through there, and so the, the engagement of the activity becomes a public aspect and feature. And plant the roofs and develop the greenhouses as part of the urban agriculture program that is now working in concert with the community. And let the power plant become its own new form that sort of has pulsing conditions of light and people moving around it on all sides throughout the community uh, to engage both day and night in the activities and surroundings. It's still a, a landmark at the scale of the highway, but a, a, a neighbor in terms of its engagement. And this former steam station is now open and program as part of the neighborhood functions and operations. And I have one more, which is the Constitution Gardens. This is a project um, on the National Mall. We're teamed with Pete Walker and partners um, out of Berkeley. This was also a competition. So the National Mall with L'Enfance Grid, which I talked about before. And this is the location of Constitution Gardens. The story is that as recently as 1974, this was covered with bureaucratic buildings for the, built by the War Department during World War II. And Nixon was president and said, this is, you know, can't stand for the bicentennial. We're going to tear all of those buildings down, and we're going to build a park within the mall. And this will be Constitution Gardens. And so they did. It did it very quickly. It was designed by SOM with the landscape architect Dan Kiley. Uh, that was at the peak of SOM and Kiley's careers. Really terrific, obviously an amazing commission uh, to take on that, that piece. But they built it very quickly, and we believe from soils tests that a lot of the rubble was actually left. And so the lake was built as they did in those days. It's a concrete lined basin, which means it basically has no ecological capacity and is treated like a big pool and therefore has all kinds of the problems that pools have. And the landscape was really uh, almost incapacitated by the poor soils. Um, the trees you're looking at here are 50 year old trees this big around. And those are the ones that survived. There's about 200 stumps throughout Constitution Gardens as well. And so when we looked at it and walked around, we said, well, actually, the original ideas and the propositions for this park within the mall were, were solid. There was an, an idea about this body of water. Um, they wanted to create some topography that was rolled and moved and was not just the flatness of the great lawn panels elsewhere on the mall. Um, they wanted to have a specific kind of landscape. Uh, they had proposed a pavilion uh, as part of the park, as a place for concessions and rest and relaxation when you're on these long, marching, sunny visits through the mall, and that it should have circulation routes to move through there. And when we looked at it, we said, you know, all of those things are good, but they were not good enough. And so let's make, the, let's make the water body into a really rich feature. Let's take the topography and push it, make it almost voluptuous in its quality as it moves around. Make a robust landscape, reconsider the pavilion, and add circulation paths throughout. And so the 
the origins of the sort of this biomorphic lake are really in the work of Burley Marx and others, and, and we wanted to embrace that. We thought that was terrific, and in fact, you could begin to uh, manage that also three-dimensionally. We're gonna, what we're gonna do is collect all of the bad soils and use that to create the humps and rolls in the hills, and then bring in new layers of, of quality organic material above it, but it also gives us visual and acoustic relief from Constitution Avenue, which is the big car and bus route that is immediately adjacent to the north of the park. And make this a, a place of robust ecology with a sort of rich planted lake edge, the circulation paths, flower gardens, and a wide variety of plant species. We're going to keep a, some of the trees that are there and actually move them around in phases so that they actually belong in there and then replant other areas and develop this highly robust and energetic lake's edge and, and vegetative gardens throughout the park to create a place that really is a park within the National Mall and as, as we've thought of it as a place of respite and relaxation. This is immediately adjacent to the Vietnam's Veteran Memorial, which is to the west. And if you know the World War II Memorial, that's actually just to the south with the refl long reflecting pool. And so it's, it's, a, it's one of the places on the mall where there's the most kind of emotive content. And the idea of this as a place of respite is really a, a, a break from that kind of routine of these incredible memorial experiences. And if you've got children with you, you can stop, you can get something to eat, you can hit a restroom, you can do these things. And so part of the development of the architecture was to say there was a concept for this pavilion, and I think we need to reconsider it now about what actually belongs here as a building, as a thing, as a, as a place. But since they built the World War II Memorial down here. And if you know it, it's an absolutely classical axial piece. And now that it's got this north-south axis, which is the point of entry to the memorial from Constitution Avenue, there, the location of the original pavilion is no longer possible because it would intrude upon the sight lines and route that goes down to the World War II Memorial. So we said, okay, let's just push the pavilion out towards the lake and actually let it cantilever a little bit and become the threshold moment that allows you to move from the upper layer of the park down to the lake lower of the park, lake level of the park and give you a place of prospect to sort of view the things that are to the west, which is the site for Vietnam, Korean, and Lincoln Memorial, but also look back to the east where you see the Washington Monument, the African American Museum, which is under construction, and look back towards the Capitol. And once we pushed the pavilion over, we also decided to splay it perspectively so that it clearly had a kind of front and back and was not universal. It, it, you enter from one side and you move up and look out across the lake and tip it up just enough so that you don't really get the view until you arrive at that viewing porch over the lake. So it's a series, it's a, it's a threshold moment where you can move from upper level to lower level. You can move through it to this long viewing porch. There's actually going to be a restaurant that's on that main level, and the lower level is concessions and restrooms and parks maintenance service. One of the challenges with the mall is that there's almost no um, facilities for maintenance that are quick and easy and available to the rest of the places on the mall. So it's got this kind of service component in a very literal way, and then it's got a service component relative to visitorship. and. We felt incredibly important that working in the context on the mall, where this is not a monument, this is not a museum, that it needed to be incredibly deferential. 
Um, and so it's a long, low, clean shell that sits completely within the treed canopy of Constitution Gardens. So as a building, it exists for that piece of the park only. It's not about longer, other, more consequential views. And is really a place where you understand that this is a place where you can go and it, it reads immediately as this, the building for those services of respite that the rest of the park is trying to embrace with its ecology and circulation so that you can move through it down to the water. We can host a whole range of kind of supportive events that are part of it there. It's got the dining facility, which we talked about, and then lets you reach down to the lake and engage the water. And Constitution Gardens is not just for the 24 million people a year who visit the National Mall, but it's also a place for people who live and work in DC. And so the idea of this as a park space then is really to let the pavilion enable a much richer and diverse programming of that park space throughout the year, from music to the cafe to assembly, observation, concessions, and ice skating, allowing us to actually program the entire park because now we've got a base facility of operations to enable these things to happen throughout the place. So we can actually imagine ice skating on the mall in the winter and fulfilling the idea that it's this quiet moment of place that exists within the context of the overall mall uh, as a place to be. And from our perspective um, on, on the architecture is to come in and in recognition of the sort of the SOM and Kylie original notions and update those but with an understanding that uh, our mission is to come in and deliver a really clean, poetic architecture that is quietly respectful and demure of the sort of vertical mass and memorials that exist around it, but completely identifies with that particular place. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I must say your works, uh, they are so immensely thoughtful from the small details to the big things. And they have this magic touch to turn heavy things light and the mundane, poetic, and beautiful. So yes, it's, they are very delightful. Uh, given the time, would you take two, three questions? Happy, happy to take questions if anybody would like. Um, I, I, I found your body of work very beautiful and I think it was um, from, even from the beginning you were talking about sort of taking ideas from the landscape, the nature, and then sort of you slowly um, started talking about body of work that um, sort of dealing with things not on just an architectural level but also sort of um, looking at the open spaces the adjacent landscape, the ecology. Um, so it was really, I was wondering sort of, is it the, un the understanding of nature of landscape is it sort of essential to you um, in making building and spaces in a literal and the metaphorical sense? And, and you also mentioned that there are few landscape architects in your office and how, um, how do you sort of engage them in an architectural office? Great. You know, I think the, the gist of it is that the, the complexity of problems of the city, of, of where architecture is now, and landscape and urban design, the presumption that you can't solve it without using all those disciplines, I think, is the one to challenge. And so when you really look at a problem beyond its borders and its context, not in the sense of what things look like, but it's the real world in which you're going to engage and build a project. I, I think that we feel like we need all of those disciplines. Some of them within our office, sometimes we're teamed. I mentioned a lot of projects where we team with landscape architects. 
Um, and sometimes you have to build the complexity of the team around the specific project. And other projects we'll do, we have the landscape or urban design piece within our office we think is adequate. So I, I wouldn't say that we think we can do everything to the right extent, but I think that it, it creates an understanding. And we work together in the sense that those disciplines participate from the very beginning. And um, you didn't ask me, but I'll go there a little bit, which is how this came to be so important to me is when I first started my practice, uh, I did about five houses out in Wyoming. And discovered really quickly that actually the way you treat the land is more important than what you put on it in that kind of a climate and that kind of environment. And it, it sparked my own interest and intrigue to come back into the projects we do in the city with that same attitude. Any other questions? Tough question, um, because like one of the reasons I use images to talk about delight is that you kind of have a, you have a much better sense of what it is than how to accomplish it. Um, and it, it's a when certain kind of ideas align in a way that, that gets people to react in a more than positive way. And that is probably the, the kinds of ways that communicates is different for different people. On Governor's Island, when we proposed the hills and the competition, nobody really understood. And Dan Doctoroff, who was charged by Mayor Bloomberg to run the competition and do the whole thing, and we knew that we were kind of in the top one or two, we had to sit down with him and he said, yeah, but what about these hills, you know? I don't get it. I said, Will you give us two hours, come out to the island, and have to climb up, because the elevators are all dead, one of the old military buildings, climb up the fire stairs, and stand on the roof of that building, 10 stories high, in the middle of New York Harbor with 360 degrees views, and he was there for 30 seconds, and he says, I get it. And, you know, you can't, so you can't explain necessarily, and we told him, Oh man, it's gonna be cool. Wait till you see, you can see everything up there. You see the harbor and the thing and everything. It's like, uh, what, with hills? I don't get it, you know, what is this with the thing? And, and that was it. And so it's different in different ways. At Syracuse, when we came in and said, you know, making it look good is not gonna do anything. You, you gotta change the program. There were two people on the jury that like, you know, a light bulb went off and said, wow, that's true. That's really true. And by pure luck, I wish I could say we'd researched it, pure luck, this Falk College of Human Sciences had just hired a leading European expert in urban agriculture. And somebody on the jury knew that and made the link and say, you know, they just hired so-and-so and we could put the thing and do it. it was, and all of a sudden, the, 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 it was no longer an idea from the architects in presenting the work, it became an idea for the university. And then it just took its own legs to go forward from there. So it's, it's really hard because I don't know how intentional you can be for those moments, but if you set it as a goal, you're way more likely to achieve it than if you wait for it to be incidental or accidental. Maybe one last question.
Yeah. Um, I love to do programming. And I think that you can't control the design process unless you control the program. And especially on things like university buildings and other sorts of things, you know, to end, be a, a, a program is not a spreadsheet. Uh, a program is a collection of spatial ideas. And they have to conform to all kinds of different requirements. But uh, I don't, for me, you have to control the program. Otherwise, you're, you're severely limited in the kind of opportunities or results that you can produce. Um, and I saw that we did a project for the University of Georgia, a master plan for their School of Art. They had 14 departments in 12 locations all over the campus. Um, and so the goal was to bring them together into a new building. And they had had two academic programmers go through the exercise. And both times, it resulted in a square footage program that grossly exceeded the budget and the site that had been allocated by the Board of Regents. And the, we finally got hired by the director of the school, as opposed to the, all the facilities guys. Like, OK, we'll try anything now. And <clears throat> we'd done other programming for other kind of institutes and, and said, you have to change the way you're looking at it. What you've got is you have 14 departments, and they all self-define. And therefore, it, they're moving in these pieces. But the reality is, if you change the way you think about the school and say, who needs natural light? Who needs water? Who needs ground level entry because they have heavy stuff? Who does smelly things? Who's got dust control problems? And across all of those different departments, you'll find that there's a whole different set of affinities that actually could structure how they use the space. And if you could begin to get a little bit of collaboration and coordination across the other lines of affinity outside of departmental understandings, you could actually seriously contract the amount of space that you actually had to have to perform the academic things that were there. And nobody wanted shared space when they had to talk about it in the context of my department, share that with your department, no way. But if it was about, hey, I'm going to have this one big dirty yard and you get a piece of it, that was OK for the sculptors. So we were able to contract the program down to get to a place where we could actually start the architecture. And I think you need to have that grip on the program to do complex, comprehensive, and delightful things. Thank you very much. We'll continue our conversation at the dinner. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>